So uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, today we're gonna be talking on how should your OSPO work for inner source with inner source. Uh, but first of all, uh, let's introduce ourselves and tell you where, why are we here. So my name is Ana Jimenez. Some of you might know me as the OSPO project manager at uh, Tutor Group, OSPO Community of Practice. Uh, pre previous to that, I had uh, experience in open source by working in an awesome company called Viteria, who was is uh, focused on software development analytics firm and um, community health analytics. In there, I got a lot of experience in working with OSPOs and also ISPOs. Um, I related with my background, I hold a master's in data science, and now I'm getting more into the front end world, uh, pursuing a master in front end. And in my spare time, I contribute to other projects beyond Tudu, such as Chaos, that is another Linux Foundation project focused on community health analytics, Open Chain, communities focused on compliance, and Inner Source Commons. Um, and uh, yeah, that's all about me. All right, thanks, Anna. Uh, my name is Russ Rutledge. I'm the executive director of the Inner Source Commons Foundation. The mission of the foundation is to uh, spread education, awareness, and adoption of inner source uh, throughout the industry and throughout the world. Uh, that's part-time for me, uh, a full-time job as a senior director at WellSky, which is a health technology company that's leading the charge uh, in innovation and coordinated and better care through technology. And there I uh, lead the inner source program and just the general collaboration uh, initiatives between business units at WellSky. So uh, before we start our uh, talk, I want to give an overview with an example that, that we think uh, encompasses a lot of the feel that we see between open source and inner source. And it's uh, in this uh, constellation in the sky, uh, Gemini, the twins. Uh, this is uh, based on Greek mythology. There are two brothers, Castor and Pollux, uh, born of the same, uh, the same mother and their story throughout their lives and throughout the mythological events that they participated in was always interweaving, always supporting e each other. I think most famously, uh, uh, they were involved in the myth of Jason and the Argonauts who went to capture the Golden Fleece. That's a popular one that you may have heard of before. Uh, at the end of uh, their life, as uh, Pollux was dying, Castor implored his father Zeus to uh, save his brother, and Zeus put them both uh, in the stars, and that's the, the story behind the Gemini constellation. And there's a lot here that reminds us of the relationship between open and inner source. Uh, clearly, these are two uh, separate things, but their story is always interwound, and they go places together and do and do great things together in the same way that these brothers did. And the story isn't written yet, but we would love it if in the end we were also immortalized in, in the heavens. We'll, we'll see how that ends up. <laughs> we're still working on that one. But I, I love here the, the stars, if you look at them, you can see that clearly there's two, two separate you know, twins that are there. Um, but part of it is shared as well. You see the star in the middle, um, you know, like maybe that's a shared uh, between. And there might be multiple shared. Uh, maybe they're, or they're, they're clasping each other, their arms uh, overlapping on one another's shoulders. And I love that that's the shared uh, spot. I love to think of Castor and Pollux uh, each reaching out to support the other uh, as brothers. And that's the ethos that we see in the way to think, uh, a way to think or contextualize kind of open source and inner source. Uh, open source, of course, you know, code is publicly available to use, uh, distribute, uh, uh, modify. Uh, I'm sure the audience here is aware of that. And then uh, inner source um, is the application of the lessons learned from open source, applying it to the way companies work internally. And it's not just about the code availability and distribution and modification, but the habits and the technology, the ethos, the mindset, the ways of working that make open source work in the real world, applying that whole ecosystem of lessons uh, to the way software is developed internally. And so when Putting these open source and inner source practices in a company, uh, we can see different setups, right? So uh, if a company decides to focus on inner source, you can see that inner source is, uh, 
is focusing on processes, on tooling, on culture, and on developer experience uh, to make sure that they are uh, building this culture, building the processes to, to make that happen. And in an organization, if you're looking to how op the organization is managing open source, it's just go a bit wider, but they should be also taking care on how are the process being integrated? Uh, is the tooling uh, helping to navigate through the open source dynamics? Uh, is there a culture of sharing, which sometimes there are some overlap, might be overlaps on, within our source, and uh, also focusing on the developer engagement, like for instance, to contribute to open source projects. And uh, there might be some difference, but, someti but uh, sometimes there are ways or different uh, activities where inner source, uh, the team uh, in inner source and the team in open source should be talking to each other. There, there are something that they can uh, share and, and, and avoid this um, overlap, right? So um, the people that usually are uh, managing these op open source operations, the people that are in this green open source sphere within the organization, um, is usually uh, happening through open source program offices. So these are, this is one example from, from Sony. This is, comes from a project we're having into the group called the Osmo Book Project. It's public. And I think it, I like a lot the graphic because it serves really well, like how uh, the OSPO is working directly with the open source community, but they also need to do a lot of efforts internally. Of course, it's because of uh, for open source context, but they also need to talk with management, they need to talk with the business units to integrate open source operation in, on its tech infrastructure and engineering processes. Thanks. Uh, for the, the ISPO, the Inner Source Program Office, uh, the goal and reason to, uh, to have a program office around Inner Source and their mission is to uh, yeah, facilitate the adoption of Inner Source into those areas we looked at earlier, into company processes, tooling, and culture. We'll talk about in a little bit some more specific examples of that. But so that the company can achieve its Inner Source goals. And here with the setup of an ISPO, I really want to emphasize the last part of that sentence, you know, so that the company can achieve its inner source goals. Uh, uh, there may be very different reasons why a company wants to set up an inner source practice. And the ISPO, in order to be successful, needs to not only focus on what brings about this open source style of behavior, but also being sure to connect it in a way that that behavior uh, meets, its, uh, meets the goals the company has for it. Uh, as an example, uh, one, one aspect of, of inner source uh, that we'd like to see is uh, pull requests and contributions coming from uh, around the company. But if a, a goal that the company has related to inner source is to accelerate its key initiatives, um, any metrics around those contributions or pull requests aren't necessarily equal across the company. Uh, a pull request or contribution that is directly moving one of the main company initiatives forward uh, is of higher value and something that needs to uh, be focused on and celebrated and encouraged uh, different than a pull request or contribution in some other part of the company. There's value in all of them, but understanding how that value translates into the goals for which the InterSource Program Office is, is formed is an extremely important and part, part of, of having that ISPO so it can continue to have the support that it needs from those that set it up. And uh, just uh, before going any farther, we're going to be sharing uh, at this point some uh, similarities and differences, some uh, common activities that we have been hearing in our past communities, but we want to uh, emphasize that um, there might be different ISPOs, and uh, your ISPO is not my ISPO, and the same way your OSPO is not my OSPO. So uh, please keep in mind when uh, now we are going to be sharing some of the common activities there might be other ESPOs, there might be other OSPOs that maybe they have a, a fourth angle or a fourth pillar that we are not mentioning. So 
um, just please keep that in mind. So we, uh, in regards with the similarities and differences, um, oh, yeah, I just forgot about one thing, that is um, there are some similarities and differences, and for instance, uh, regarding why starting an OSPO, that might be the first difference of maybe why there are OSPOs so different. Because some OSPOs might be focusing only on, okay, I want to manage the security risk and legal risk. And there are others that, apart from that, they also want to gain leadership above across key open source projects. So those OSPOs are gonna be so different because the goals are gonna be different. And depending on the, the kind of goals or the kind of priorities this organization is thinking of, there might be putting more efforts in open source, they might be putting more efforts in inner source, and so on. Yep. And same thing for the ISPO. I talked about the, the various goals. So we know from conversations that are happening in the inner source commons, uh, reports uh, from industry publications and McKinsey and Gartner, I'd say there's you know, roughly these four categories or classes that I've seen of types of goals for running an inner source program. And it's not like there's necessarily only one. A particular company might have multiple of these that they're interested in seeing as results from inner source. But it's important to understand uh, what they are when setting up an ISPO or working uh, in, in an ISPO. And I guess as an aside, um, whether or not uh, uh, inner source effort at a company is called an ISPO or an inner source program office. Uh, if there's a person or a group that's tasked with supporting inner source at the company, all of these things that we're saying you know, apply equally, whether or not it's uh, actually called ISPO by name. So just going through, let me speak a little bit about each of the goals here. Uh, let me just oh, speak. So. Yeah. yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. I'm excited to move on too. <laughs> but I'm excited to share just a little bit more detail about these goals. Uh, engineering efficiency is a top one we hear. This is like, uh, I want to reduce duplicated work. We're wasting time. We're reinventing the wheel, you know, not making the best use of engineering resources. Uh, inner source, uh, uh, you can share code without inner source, but what's seen is when code becomes widely shared, it can be a bottleneck, and the team supporting a highly shared piece of code can have difficulty keeping up with either the amount of changes needed or the type of changes needed. Uh, with inner source, um, if central team is not keeping up, those that are, uh, can contribute, uh, that need a change and are waiting for it, can just contribute themselves. And also, uh, when contributions are made to central projects, it's far more likely that uh, those, the updated functionality is gonna be useful and hit the mark of what the consumers of the project actually, actually need. Uh, so that, so InterSource uh, helps that sharing to happen without that shared module becoming bottleneck. Uh, next, uh, innovation. Uh, we've heard of companies that their primary reason for starting InterSource uh, is they want to unlock innovation. That's why they're in it. We hear reports from the uh, a Bosch company, a German company. That was their primary reason for starting InterSource. This is like creating a space where anyone at the company can start a new project, you know, uh, whether or not it's been, been funded you know, top down, uh, they can go ahead and start that. So there's innovation that way in terms of new projects. And I know they were actually able to have a project that was started as InterSource that then got taken up and adopted and ended up making it into one of their, their product lines. Uh, another type of innovation is within existing projects, having ideas come from around the company in the form of code not having it to be something that only the central team uh, can build. Uh, that's another part of unlocking innovation. Uh, next reason, developer happiness. InterSource is an incredibly empowering way to work. Uh, it shares and distributes influence and power uh, over projects with whoever has the initiative, uh, the time, the ability to contribute. Could be contribute to roadmap of an InterSource project, contribute uh, code to inner source project. And that sense of empowerment is something that uh, is good and adds to developer happiness, uh, happiness index. Uh, also for uh, younger generation coming into workforce, open source has been around their uh, entire technical career and probably for their entire life by now. So it's just something that they assume is going to happen. It's part of the way that they want to work. 
And companies know that they need to have uh, inner source practice so that these expectations from rising generation of workforce can be met. Um, and then one more here, uh, preparation for open source. Uh, for some uh, companies, primary motivation is uh, to prepare to release something as open source. Uh, this could be preparing the particular projects, preparing the company at large, or preparing some of the people involved uh, with, with habits that are needed. Uh, so that's a role that Intersource can fill as well, and sometimes the motivation. Oh, sorry, now we can go to the next slide. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, I like a lot this slide because so when Ross and I was meeting and trying to map like these similarities, differences on OSPOS, ESPOS, um, we, we started to, to came like a set of like common points. Okay, like what, what are OSPOS doing? What are ESPOS doing? And even though they were similarities, like okay, they, they are building policies, processes, developer engagement, compliance, education, business units, we found um, that there were a bit of differences in, 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 in terms of context, right? Yeah. So um, I don't know if, you, uh, just one, one example I see, for instance, uh, when, try, when thinking about compliance management, OSPOS might be looking more into, okay, I'm using open source projects in my software development supply chain. Uh, how can I uh, manage the dependencies? How can I build the ASBOM? Uh, but more from the open source projects, right? Uh, and maybe from the security point of view, that angle might be more powerful or might be more important from the OSPO perspective because it's like, wow, okay, I'm using open source and I need to be secure. I need to manage security risk um, because if something goes wrong, I can take a really big impact for my organization and outside the media. Um, let me just speak to Intersource. Maybe we can yeah. both go through these together. So Intersource is similar for, uh, for compliance management. The security angle does come in. One thing that can happen is if there's some type of vulnerability in open source software that's being brought into the, the company, obviously we want to know where that is. That can overlap with Intersource because sometimes you have an Intersource project that brings in an open source project, kind of wraps it up and packages it up. And then that inner source project is then spread further in the organization. So companies need to understand not only open source dependencies, but inner source dependencies. And uh, vulnerabilities can be brought in through an inner source project and expanded wider. It's also possible for an inner source project itself uh, to be the one introducing the vulnerability. And in the same way, you know, that can be spread throughout the company. Uh, so at WellSky, we have uh, agreement with our security team around Intersource about what happens when a vulnerability is found in an Intersource project. And uh, if uh, we have a remediation, uh, remediation playbook about, uh, about what happens in that, and it had to be updated for Intersource to know what to happen. You know, who's responsible for the patch? How do we know uh, which of our solutions it's a part of? And we've been able to automate that and have that all mapped out. So there is a process to, to follow. Uh, with Intersource, it's slightly different because we not only need to know about it, uh, we need to make the fix uh, ourselves. You know, perhaps that might happen in, in open source, but there's others who have the ability to make fix. But Intersource, it's just like within the company, the fix needs to be made. And then we need to track that that's uh, rolled out. Um, another uh, part of uh, compliance management is also around uh, licensing. Uh, there are inner source uh, licenses uh, that we've uh, learned through our community participants. Uh, at first, I was a little uh, surprised uh, when I think of open source license, it's specifying how it can be used. And you might think, well, we're all within the same company. Uh, you know, feel, feel free to, to use it however, what's the need for a license? And where this uh, has come up in some ways is in some organizations, although they're collaborating on code, uh, to operate in different countries, uh, different uh, political areas of separate legal entities uh, that people are working with, but they still want to share code across legal entities. And sometimes there's uh, guidance or restrictions or instructions on how to do that in the legally compliant way. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, taxation can be involved since intersource and code is something of value and that's being shared across legal boundaries. 
Uh, at times, there is, you know, that can be a, a taxable situation for some organization setups. And the licensing and compliance for InterSource uh, needs to be able to support and handle that so InterSource can happen. And, and another of the things we commented ar around developer engagement and advocacy, we found out that some OSPOs, uh, they develop like open source champions or open source uh, like advocacy programs uh, to um, identify like people that are contributing or uh, they are helping uh, open source communities out there in the same way that inner source have some kind of inner source champions. Is yeah, that yeah, the, yeah. how they call it? Yeah, we do our champions and advocacy programs. What it looks like is this: these are our internal. These are internal champions. We have multiple companies in the inner source commons that are doing this. It's like you identify uh, areas of the company, uh, uh, usually by business unit or by vice president, and make sure there's some inner source advocate or champion that's placed in each uh, development area of the company that might naturally be a silo on its own. And those champions meet together frequently. A lot of companies maybe have a once a month champions meeting. And part of their job is to bring the concerns of business unit to the ISPO or those that are managing InterSource. And then also to take out to their business units and in general to be an advocate for, for InterSource. So it's mm. that internal advocacy. Yeah, and I, I heard some OSPOs, they call like matrix of experts and in OSPOs, for instance, like, okay, how, how can I talk the OSPO with the legal team, the OSPO with the engineering team? So they have some kind of matrix of experts that has the open source knowledge. So uh, yeah, it's similar, but different context, of course. Um, and I, just, I just wanted to add on, yeah. sorry for this one. Uh, really what this is, is about, uh, uh, to my view, is like to have a sustained culture change. And this ambassadors or, or advocates program can be one of those. But I just wanted to point out, this is a, a culture change uh, uh, problem or opportunity. And in an ISPO uh, or inner source situation, it's gonna be a culture change for many people. And to sum it up, you need to be intentional about that, not only at the beginning, but on an ongoing basis. Now there's like entire talks and there's probably an entire conference somewhere just on sustained culture change in an enterprise situation. All I'll say is if you find things like that in addition to the tidbits we're giving, everything uh, that I see in that space applies pretty directly to the type of outreach uh, that's needed in this area to, to have this engagement advocacy for InterSource. And then regarding policies and processes, I think one of a distinction in the OSPO is that when creating guidelines and contributions and use, uh, they need to add like how, how, how the open source um, project is go being governed. Like they really need to go and understand like how open source community is working. Like it's not something that you can say, okay, this is how they are gonna be working. Like they need to have deep understanding on how governance models work there and they need to to get inside a community that already exists and maybe has been existing like for a long time ago. Um, maybe that is something that can be different in, in, in our source when creating these guidelines. Yeah, for, for inner source, uh, we want some of the same community activity and contribution to happen inside the company. But since everything's within organization, uh, at many times there's a higher level of influence that the ISPO has. So you can have things like a standard contributing uh, agreement or guidelines that are across the company. So not each project needs to figure out uh, what's gonna be their contribution process. Uh, there can be policy on, on minimum standard for something to be inner source ready at the company and an automated way to audit that. So it could be something like you need to have readme filled out and contributing, or you need to have local dev instructions, automated tests that run you know, before on every pull request is a requirement that we've seen before. So the ISPO can set these uh, and have an automated way to check if they're being met. And what this does is give potential consumers and contributors inside the company a consistent experience. It's a little bit like some of the regulation that we enjoy as, as consumers. Like if you go to the grocery store, uh, you probably don't feel like you have to check if like food safety handling standards have been met. You can have confidence, you can buy some food and have expectation of the type of quality that you're going to find. And that leads to a better shopping experience and more confident to go shopping in the first place and not just grow your own. 
um, you know, the analogy, I think being clear uh, for intersource, like the safety and standard that that makes encourages people to participate. Um, one other, actually, uh, on, or a few others on policy and process. Uh, another one I think is unique to intersource inside the company is, uh, is working intersource and the time that's needed as a contributor or as a maintainer into the processes that the company has, especially on how time is managed. Uh, there's a question in the last, um, uh, in one of the, in an earlier session about, uh, you know, how is time tracked uh, for uh, for reporting? Uh, some companies uh, report like capitalizable uh, time, you know, for tax purposes. Like, how does that come into play for intersource? Uh, if I'm in a sprint and a pull request comes in, where does the time come for me to go and look at that? Or is there like a ticket built in, or do I have a buffer? If I uh, have a, a contribution to be made, uh, how do I block off time for sprints, uh, for that in a sprint? If an intersource contribution is part of the upcoming roadmap, how is that detailed in our quarterly uh, plan? These are all places where time is managed anyway, and intersource takes time, so the ISPO can set uh, policy and process about how that time is to be represented, and it facilitates it because not every group has to try to figure that out uh, on their own. I'll stop there. Yeah. So we go to the next. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, to the we next can. Slide. Did you have anything on on uh, sea level support? So I was. I think like the next slides will be will explain a little bit better because the yeah. next slides are more related with okay and where where is the uh, well also adding like. Uh, even though we have been, there are some similarities and maybe there are some overlaps. I feel like it's it's more like where where should I invest? Like ISPO, OSPO, the two of them. I feel it all depends on on the on, on the critical needs the organizations needs or or are looking for uh, to improve the IT strategy. So if you're coming more in a regulated industry, maybe open source is not the first place or the first step to move on like that can be uh, they might they might be putting other way more weights on inner source practices uh, and to figure out that uh, measurement to know like what's going on and what do you need it's really really important um, so yeah I think like uh, the like how open source and inner source can come together um, I think like this, you wanted to, to explain more, right? Like how can inner source be a preparation for open source? Yeah, yeah, I, I see, mentioned this earlier. Sometimes this is the pure uh, mo motivation. Uh, but yeah, in three ways, uh, people gain the habits and mindset needed for open source and also get experience with, uh, with the tooling. The Apache Pulsar project started this way as an inner source project at Yahoo before going Yahoo open source and then you know to Apache. And uh, at, on a, that's on a project level. At a company-wide uh, level, uh, PayPal, uh, who was involved in the founding of the Intersource Commons, started this way. Uh, Denise Cooper was brought in as head of open source at PayPal. And in uh, wanting to get the company in a position where it could be successfully hosting open source projects, uh, was, uh, felt that in order to uh, get some of the habits and mindset that were needed. The first thing that PayPal really needed was an inner source program. So Denise launched the inner source program that actually fed into the inner source commons uh, foundation in the end. But PayPal was able to use that. Uh, it was in the uh, yeah in the kind of mid 2010s when that happened. And then um, it looks like uh, Brittany's gone. But just in the previous talk, uh, Brittany Ice Dennis talking about the Fannie Mae OSPO. Uh, she'd get shared in the Intersource Commons that uh, Fannie Mae has this Intersource as preparation for open source, uh, at, also at the company-wide level. There's some projects that the code is, is vetted and ready, the maintainers are ready to, ready to go, but just from a, a, a legal and risk perspective, there's still some things that are being evaluating. And so even though uh, from that perspective, things aren't ready for open source, they're able to get a lot of the benefits of sharing uh, through intersource. And I just want to clarify also on this one um, that we're not necessarily saying that every project or every company needs to do intersource first before open source. I've, um, I've talked to enough people to know there are many advocates that you know, go straight to open source, let's do it. And that can be the right decision. 
uh, depending on company and depending on history of the company and the people. So by saying this, we're not saying it's the way it goes every time, but that it is a step that some find useful. And um, on the other hand, if uh, for OSPOS or for uh, open source team, uh, is spoken leverage open source. I think you also wanted to mention something on that, right? Like give a sort of. Yeah, yeah just some examples, mm -hmm. like thinking about how inner source and open source relate. Uh, there's kind of two categories of open source tooling that can help you to, uh, uh, to engender inner source at your company. Some tools are meant for open source and open source and inner source are like so similar, you can just use those same tools on your internal uh, repos, uh, things like automated repo linters, you know, it's like checking for a contributing file and contributing instructions. There's already open source tools out there that are meant for open source repos. You know, guess what? Uh, it's all, uh, you know, if you have, uh, you know, GitHub, both, both places within and outside your company, you can run that same tool and get a, a repo lint on your internal repos. Uh, SBOM generation is, you know, seeing what are your, seeing what are your dependencies. That's useful for some scenarios. Uh, those tools also also work. Uh, getting metrics uh, around community health, around internal projects. You can use those open source tools on your inner source project. Now there are some things that are unique to inner source, so there's not open source tools to to you know solve uh, what you're coming across for open source uh, already. Uh, for that, we need other tools. However, I'm of the opinion that other tooling to support inner source should be done as open source tooling. There's no reason for each company to reinvent very similar projects. Let's have open source projects that solve our inner source needs. Let me give an example. Again, in the Fannie Mae talk we just uh, came from, they talked about having a, an inner source project portal. I think I've heard this from at least a half dozen companies in the inner source commons. There'll be a, a listing, a central place where folks can go to find what inner source projects are available at the company. And maybe there's some metadata displayed about them, like number of contributors or technology stack involved. So that inner source project portal, one popular option for implementing it is the open source tool, uh, Backstage. Uh, Backstage IO, again, I've heard from uh, you know, probably Probably, uh, I feel like once a month, I found out a new company that has an implementation of Backstage that is has the inner source project portal. In fact, with Backstage plugin model, there's an open source plugin that's meant to enable inner source, uh, the Bazaar plugin. And I've uh, heard of multiple companies contributing to that plugin. So it's an open source plugin for enabling inner source within your company. Uh, as a more lightweight option, you know, Backstage takes uh, some effort to set up from what I hear. Uh, SAP has released an open source project, I think it's two years ago now, an inner source project, uh, inner source project portal. It's much more lightweight, uh, configuration driven, ends up being a static website, so it's a lot easier to host. And that project portal also has multiple consumers and contributors. And in fact, uh, outside of SAP, Two other organizations have released open source projects uh, designed to facilitate use of the SAP project portal. Uh, there's an AWS code pipeline project, and there's also a, a GitHub repo scanner that'll automatically scan all the GitHub repos in your organization and produce the metadata needed to run SAP's project portal. So we're not only seeing interaction around that, we're seeing like these companion projects pop up, which is pretty neat, you know, all done in open source. Uh, and just two more uh, metrics. Uh, a lot of metrics are the same between open and inner source, but some uh, metrics are uh, uh, impossible, uh, uh, impossible or difficult to collect for open source, or just not not present at all. But it end up being very important for for inner source. Uh, for inner source, the canonical one that I use is uh, seeing metrics around contributions and usage that's happening. One extremely common thing to want to do is to segment those, those metrics uh, by your org chart or by your product lines. So your company org chart becomes a data source that you want to use to filter uh, you know, your GitHub or GitLab or contribution metrics. Uh, or your suite of products and solutions is something that's used. When, okay, we're doing inner source. Which of our product lines is it affecting? That can help to show you know, the inner source is having its impact. So uh, there's, there's ways of collecting those, and I think there's opportunity for more open source metric 
uh, projects around some of these unique uh, metric dimensions for inner source. Yeah, uh, sorry, I wanted yeah. to give a, a shout out to, to Chaos, because Chaos is focused more on open source metrics, but I know by experience that you can apply some of those metrics and implement it in inner source. The way you're saying about the different product lines, in Chaos they have a, I think it's called Elephant Factor, that is more on the organizations that are contributing to an open source project. Since organizations to product lines, um, voila, you have inner source. So maybe uh, if your organization is working on metrics to report to high level managers or to C level managers, I feel like ESPOs, OSPOs are always um, frustrating about like how to communicate. Uh, might be useful maybe to collaborate together and, and, and in all oh, this metric is really, really, I mean, the data to pick up that is the same process. It's just like meaning it differently. And I just wanted to sort to comment on that. Yeah, Sorry. no, that, that, yeah, that, that, that's good. Yeah, some, sometimes the product lines are in a spreadsheet somewhere. And so we don't, we don't have it in a, in a, in a chaos metric, but, but you're right. Yeah, and the, the chaos group, I think is like, I think inner source metrics are kind of like downstream of chaos group. As far as you know, how to how to think about them, I think that's the the central place to think about metrics. Um, and just the last open source project I wanted to highlight for running an inner source program is documentation and books. The inner source commons we host multiple uh, Git books online that are entirely open source that are being built by the community of inner source practitioners. The most popular one is the inner source patterns uh, a book it has thousands of, of views every month from around the world. And anecdotally, that's the most common thing when I, I talk to a new company. I say, oh yeah, we checked out the inner source patterns and they're really helpful. And we also have, for more specific advice, that those patterns are kind of abstract. And there's some specific guides, more specific content in the Managing Inner Source Project book. So both of those are published as Git books, but they're not done yet. So we continually are having new contributions of patterns and chapters. And all that happens via pull requests on public GitHub is open source. All right, so uh, final remarks from today's uh, talk. Um, I think we have been always mentioned, right? Like, don't create, reuse, uh, talk with OSPO, uh, talk with the OSPO, because there might be some common points where uh, you can avoid duplicating effort and, and, and learn how to work together. You want to say this next one? Oh, <laughs> like, oh yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, sure, the, the, the synergies. Um, yeah, this is a point of how uh, OSPO itself, uh, sometimes OSPO has internal uh, projects or documentation. Uh, OSPO itself can leverage inner source in collaborating across the company. Uh, any uh, documentation or projects that are had can be invited to be contributed to by anyone in the company. So OSPO itself can leverage inner source in fulfilling OSPO mission. And, and last but not least, um, we really mentioned as well, like maybe it cannot work for all the organizations, but some of them, especially the ones in, in highly regulated industry, uh, you can cultivate open source readiness so through inner source um, and uh, making uh, the team and the organization's business units to have more open source habits to then make it easier to to have contributions to the open source community or release or release open source projects. And well, right. if you uh, want to learn more about uh, these two communities uh, in Tutor Group, uh, you can go to tutorgroup.org. We have a bunch of resources like the Tutor to get an OSPO, uh, Tutor Guides, the OSPO landscape, OSPO surveys. Uh, you have all the information on how to join the community or uh, support as associate or member. Yep. And you can do that in InterSource Commons too. <laughs> All right, and then, yes, do we have time for questions? Yeah, yep. okay. Yeah, front row. If a company is heavily focused on open source, which is probably pretty typical, does it make sense to incubate InterSource for a while as a, an adjunct to open source and then try to grow it in yeah, so the question was, if we're already doing uh, open source and have a, a strong practice there, uh, should inner source be incubated as, as, as part of the open source? 
uh, at least at the beginning. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll give my thought off top of head, and yeah, and then you can go to Anna if you want. Uh, for me, I think it depends on what is your goal uh, uh, related to it. Uh, if uh, certainly, if goal is to have more open source happen by teaching these habits internally to translate to more open source uh, adoption, which it probably would be for such a case, I think that it would make sense. Uh, some of the, uh, depending how strong the open source practices are to see, like, would it overlap any of the other goals? Like, if the goal is uh, engineering efficiency uh, for inner source, and it depends a little bit on what the, the goal of the OSPO is. You know, is the, the goal of the OSPO on a regulatory compliance or something like that? And the way the OSPO is set up might be very different than the types of advocacy they're needed for an engineering efficiency labeled inner source, uh, inner source program. That's one reason why we started with, like, what are your goals for the OSPO and what are the goals for the ISPO? And in theory, you could have like a complete matrix, like you, know, you had I think about four different goals for the OSPO, four for the ISPO, and putting those together, you know, you might fall like anywhere in that 16 grid. So the answer, you know, could be different depending on it. Uh, if the goals are aligned, I think it makes sense. You just can't answer, you know, right away. So you need to understand the goals of each and, and think from there. And, and I also think that um, it can work better um, maybe when there is a large organization with different business units across different countries uh, like i've know that some ospos have like some organizations instead of having one ospo they have multiple ospos for different uh, business units and different countries and sometimes i i, I was speaking with uh Ross, like, oh maybe they need like inner source or start to do some inner source to first collaborate all the OSPOs is, is kind of crazy. And, but I feel like the larger organization is, is maybe that uh, model can work. Yeah. Uh, we do see, like you say, even some OSPO, yeah, they may not be doing all the collaboration they, they could already. Mm -hmm. So, it, so un unfortunately it depends. <laughs> Yeah, when it comes to uh, open source, a lot of companies have policies around contributions depending on what kind of project it is in relation to the company. Like you might have like company sponsored or company led. And the other part is what I want to talk about. It's the uh, on your own time kind of thing. It's like, you know, uh, uh, just a, uh, a thing that the developer is interested in, but it has nothing to do with their work, right? It's typically something they do on their own time, right? Uh, and you might have something that just, you know, some sort of process that says, okay, as long as that thing doesn't compete with the company's interest, then you're good. When it comes to inner source, you talked about how the ISPO, or you know, just uh, the OSPO talking about the inner source methodology, might say, hey, this is how you can use it when it comes to your time reporting or not. But what about when it comes to a developer that sees some inner source things that are out there and they're interested in contributing to something and getting involved in something that has nothing to do with what they're working on. Yeah, is that something that uh, you know, you've know you seen or heard anybody have um, you know, edicts about, like you know, carve out a certain amount of time where they can do that, their sort of passion projects, that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah I'll take that one. It's like, let the hackathon never end. <laughs> you, know, let's, let's, you know, let's keep going. Um, so uh, I, I, I'll give the same answer. First of all, to understand you know, what are the goals. For an ISPO where innovation is the goal, that might be uh, something that's right there. First, for an ISPO related to engineering efficiency, they probably want to see, hey, I'm delivering a roadmap item. I'm blocked, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do, do inner source. Um, I, I, I have heard... Um, I've heard of like a 10% time policy. It's been more as a maintainer. Uh, if I uh, am maintaining an inner source project, uh, and it may not be related to the day job of my team, but it's used widely throughout the company, that person will have time uh, you know, blocked out or you know, like a buffer in your sprints uh, for it. For on the, and we have at, actually, at, uh, my job at WellSky, we have several projects that are, are running this way. And a lot of them are, are things that once had a full-time team and now a full-time team isn't needed. So it's kind of a group of maintainers. 
and they each this is just understood on their teams. They have a little bit of time, uh, and you know, no one gives them a hard time about it. Is it from a maintainer perspective? From the contributor perspective, to have time, uh, one thing that we see is big blocks of time, like a, a hackathon days. We may have like a company internal event. You know, this is our, our two-day hackathon. Uh, we do see companies like throw their inner source projects into that, and encourage uh, uh, inner source enabled projects to put out hackathon projects, and that's time that's just blocked off. Uh, I haven't heard anything widespread of like a. Um, I know when my career was like growing up, you know, the Google twenty percent time. Uh, I haven't heard widespread things like that on a contribution perspective. Yeah, and I think uh, from the OSPO point of view, I think the same. Like, depends on the goal. If the OSPO is there to encourage innovation, or is uh, is reporting, or is hosted under R uh, and, and D, uh, maybe that it's something that they are looking for. Uh, but it depends a, a lot again on why, in the first place, why was the OSPO created? Because sometimes if they are focused more on license compliance, security, maybe that's not one of the goals. If they are more focused on innovation. Maybe that that is even like encourage, like please create things, please have time from on your day to day job to to encourage that. Or also, there are some organizations that they're using, they want to get more involved in open source to retain talent. So the way to retain talent can be okay. Let's let's le let the developers create their things. Let's let the developers innovate. But it 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 depends. And I think the next uh, is minutes in done four or, yeah, minutes. Time. So yeah, you okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.